And welcome back to the Livingston Parish News Weekly Show, a podcast brought to you by the Livingston Parish News. It's been a while since we've seen you folks. My name is McHugh David, publisher and editor of the news, and I'm joined today by uh, the local rock star of the day and the age, uh, our esteemed congressman. I'll let him take a second to introduce himself. Good morning, sir. Hey, good morning. Uh, it's Garrett Graves. Great to be back with you. Yeah, so uh, several things to talk about. Not all of them have a bunch to do with each other, but some of them do, some of them don't. I uh, want to jump in real quick. Uh, recent, uh, there's been a special session that's wrapped up. They're yeah. now in the middle of a second one uh, before we hit the regular session. But the results of the first special session were an interesting one. Uh, and it kind of threw your life into a bit of turmoil, or at least your your political life, uh, so to speak. Uh, so if you would, please just tell the folks at home how that wrapped up, how that affects you, and what you're thinking about going forward. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there was a special session that was called very early this year after a new governor, after a new legislature was seated. And it was something that was not talked about on the campaign trail for anyone that was running for state representative, anyone that was running for state senator, and and certainly not anyone that was running for governor. Yet, it was the first special session that was called, and it was to change the way that we elect people in Louisiana. It was to change the map or the congressional districts. And just to break those down real quick. So right now, you go, you go vote, and you can choose to vote for this independent candidate who's not affiliated with a party. You can vote for this Republican, this Republican. Maybe there's a Democrat that you, you want to vote for, and you can do that. They actually voted to change the way that works to where you go in, you will be forced to vote for only one party. And, and to me, what that does is it further empowers political parties and it really takes away from the individual freedom. It, it, it forces me to vote for a, a straight ticket of candidates as opposed to me choosing. You know what? I really like this person. I think this is a better choice. And, and so, um, in fact, I've seen polls showing that somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of Louisianians want to protect this existing system where we can vote for anybody we want. Yet the legislature came in and made that change. Um, and, and so that's going to apply to congressional elections starting in 2026. It's going to end up costing an estimated $10 million um, uh, to, to implement that money that this state doesn't have right now. I'd rather see that go toward crime prevention and roads and things along those lines. Um, and they also made changes. Well, let me last note is that that's also going to force us to vote an additional time uh, during elections, because now you're going to have what's called a primary where Republicans will have to choose their candidate. Democrat will have to choose their candidate. So it's going to cause a new election, which is why it costs more money. But the second thing that they did is that they drew new maps for congressional boundaries. Right now, as you know, Livingston Parish, the entire parish, is represented in the sixth congressional district where we currently represent. What they've done is they've come into the capital region and they have split up the capital region now into four different congressional districts. So, so it's no longer that you have one person representing Livingston Parish. In fact, they drew a map that will take Livingston Parish and put it into the same district as Monroe, Louisiana. Monroe, uh, up in the northeast corner of the state. And, and you're supposed to be looking at things like communities of interest. You're supposed to be keeping communities intact. You're supposed to be having a compact area. Drawing a, a snake of a map all the way up to Monroe um, what is, what is Denham Springs, Walker, Livingston, what do they have to do and what do they have in common with Monroe? N nothing, nothing. And, and, um, they have another uh, district that they drew that will connect other areas of Livingston Parish over along the North Shore, down to Plaquemines Parish, all the way around to the Bayou region. And, and, just really drawing these snake-like figures that, that don't, really maintain communities of interest, don't maintain compactness. Now, they drew another district that goes from uh, the Gonzales area or Ascension Parish into Baton Rouge all the way up to Shreveport. <laughs> so again, what does Gonzales or Donaldsonville and Shreveport have in common? Nothing. And, and so th this map is blatantly illegal. I, I think the courts are going to throw it out. But, but what it did is it, instead of having one district that's anchored in the capital region, one person that is accountable and responsible to the capital region, you now have split it up into four where the capital region is no longer sort of the anchor or the foundation of a district. So 
nobody has to really focus on this region anymore because they have other population centers that they have that are probably more important to those congressional districts. One, there are two court cases going on right now with these maps. I think the courts are going to throw it out. I think you're going to see new maps. And I do think that Livingston Parish is ultimately going to be preserved in, a, in its own congressional district. But, but why would you do this? Why would you split up Livingston Parish? Why would you split up the capital region? Um, it, it, it really is a disservice to the capital region. It's a disservice to Livingston Parish. And again, I'm, I'm very optimistic the courts will ultimately throw this out. Important to note as well that uh, you know, you talk to people uh, south of I-12 in Livingston, and they were connected with Nettery. How, two very different... <laughs> and, and parts of New Orleans. Right. Yeah. Two very different types of people, um, you know, sharing basically a lake, sort of. Uh, so it was, an, it was very interesting when those yeah. maps came out, but I, I appreciate your commentary on that. Getting into uh, some of the things that you've been doing here in the area for years, ever since you and I first met uh, 10 years ago, goodness, uh, <laughs> hell fellow well met, uh, is we have talked several times, especially since the flood, about disaster resiliency uh, and how it is cheaper than recovery. Uh, what are some of the things you've been doing lately with regard to that? Um, and I know, you know, especially these days with uh, the way Lake Moripal functions and that kind of thing, it's become more than just you know, uh, pushing back against flooding, there's uh, hurricane force winds and that kind of thing, things that all, we're a coastal community, well, at least the southern part of the parish is. So uh, it, the, the sort of the mindset has changed. So tell us what you've been working on as of late. Yeah, sure. Uh, so McHugh, look, one thing that I just think is, is so important is that we really focus on protecting communities. You know, oftentimes the federal government comes in and will spend billions of dollars picking up the pieces after a disaster instead of spending millions of dollars on the front end, actually making communities safer and protecting them. So, so we have literally secured billions, not, not millions, but billions of dollars for investments in this region to provide better flood protection. That's everything from in, in Livingston Parish alone, we have had over 500 miles of rivers, canals, bayous, ditches, that have been cleared out, clearing and snagging, removing debris, uh, removing vegetation, things like that to allow these, these bodies of water, these streams to flow and to drain, not to be obstructed, not to be slowed down. And so we, we've, we've done that. Uh, in fact, um, I said around 500 miles, but some of these, these water uh, ways have been cleaned more than once. So I think if you add it all up, we're actually in excess of 900 miles. And this is the entire parish. Uh, has had major, major cleanup work. Uh, number two, we've secured funds to build a new outlet. As you know, uh, and most people don't appreciate this, but 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 everywhere from St. Francisville all the way down to Lake Moripaw, none of those communities, so Baton Rouge, Baker, Central, n none of those communities, of course, Denham, uh, Walker, Watson, they do not drain into the Mississippi River, regardless of the you know close proximity. They don't drain into the Mississippi River. All of it drains down, ultimately, in Lake Maurepas, Lake Pontchartrain, Lake Bourne, Gulf of Mexico. So you have the, the Comet River that runs that northwest-southeast direction. You have the Emmett River that runs the, uh, the, the northeast to, to southwest. And then it all continues down from Denham as, as the Emmett River uh, down in the Lake Maurepas. So the only, the only two outlets of, of the Emmett River that drain into Maurepas, you have the Diversion Canal and you have, ultimately, Blind River that, that, that drains. Well... We are actually funding now a third outlet uh, that we call the Highway 22 Spillway. So sort of in that um, uh, Port Vincent French settlement area, we're going to have a third outlet. And so what that does is it allows for faster drainage of the Emmett River during flood times. This, this, this outlet, this flow spillway wouldn't, wouldn't flow all the time. It's only when you have high water. And so it provides a third outlet getting water sooner, faster out into Lake Maurepas. Um, therefore, bringing water levels down faster, and that really complements some of the other work that we've done. Of course, something we've talked about since the beginning was the Comet River Diversion Project, which is um, we are now building a project that, for the first time ever, will actually connect that Comet Amit drainage basin with the Mississippi River. We're building about a a 12 mile river from the Comet um, over to the Mississippi River. This will be the first time that those are connected. And we let me say it again: we are effectively building a new river. Um, that is going to have the capacity of the Arkansas River in some cases. And uh, so that is well underway. The problem, uh, twofold, number one, 
uh, back when we came in, broke all the log jams and secured full funding for that project years ago, the Corps of Engineers told us it was going to be $342 million. So we secured all of it. Um, they came back and said they needed a little bit more. We got them a little bit more, which was about $125 million. Um, little, let me put that in parentheses there. Um, it's all relative. And, uh, and then they came back again and basically told us that they were about $406 million short. So let me say it again. 342, 125, 130. And then they came in and they, they basically said that, um, that this project was going to be just shy of a billion dollars. Um, so what that caused us to do was two things. Number one, immediately launch an investigation on why in the world, how in the world, this project's cost could have tripled. Uh, secondly, is securing money to make sure this project is finished. So we've been successful um, in securing all of the money that is needed to finish this project. We are continuing the investigation to better understand how the cost surged or skyrocketed and how we can recapture some savings and prevent this from ever happening again. Now, the, the, one of the main components of this, or a big component, is that the, they found a interstate natural gas pipeline that was built in the 1950s, still live today, providing many states with, with natural gas, that they did not realize was on the project site that actually crosses the project in three places. Um, so they actually had to relocate the gas line, which initial cost estimates on the relocation was $236 million. Um, on a project that I remind you at the time was three hundred and forty-two million, um, and so just insane things going on, unacceptable that they that they um, they didn't know that this pipeline was there. I mean, as you know, Comet Project's been around since the early '80s. I don't know what in the world people have been doing if they haven't found this pipeline, but by now, but but all sorts of curveballs thrown at us. But we have been able to work through all of them. We're still addressing some of the pipeline issues, the gas pipeline issues, but have been able to eliminate one of the uh, uh, problems and we're still working on the other two right now, the other two crossings. And, um, but ultimately the project's underway, it's gonna get finished. I'm gonna, I'm gonna absolutely see to it. We're gonna keep fighting to get this thing done. And obviously uh, broke a log jam that has been in place since the 1980s to get this project moving forward again, get it fully funded, not once, but twice or three times, I guess. And um, really excited about the progress and the new flood protection that's gonna provide to us. So. So, you know, really long answer to your question, McHugh, but bottom line is what we're doing on disaster policy is we're being proactive. We're changing from this posture of, hey, we're just going to come in and spend billions of dollars after a disaster happens, whether it's 2016 flood, Hurricane Katrina, what have you. And instead, we're going to prepare these communities for flooding. We're going to prepare these communities and prevent flooding. And ultimately, that's going to save billions of dollars. So... You know, one of the interesting things that's going on here uh, lately over the past few years is there used and still is, I shouldn't say used to be, I say used to be because a lot of changes have been made to the Amy River Basin Commission. Uh, one of one, not anything of like and kind around it, uh, but uh, for quite a few years established in the 80s uh, and, you know, may have been around some of that Comeach stuff as well as the Darlington. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about um, the changes that have been made to ARBC specifically, you know, have, have have you had more participation with ARB and that's Amy River Basin Commission for those who aren't keeping up with the acronyms. Uh, have you been participating more with the ARBC? Obviously, they're trying to be a little more proactive as well. So ARBC is effectively the levy district for the the, the Amit River uh, and for the Comet River for that that water body or that um, water basin. And, and so it has representatives from all of the parishes that, that, are, uh, that drain into or are affected by, by that watershed. And, and they are, you know, effectively the, the, the driver, the local driver for the Comet Diversion Project. Um, there were some reforms that were made to levy districts in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, consolidating levy districts, trying to make sure they had professional standards, that they had engineers and accountants and lawyers and others on the board, people that could actually bring some experience or, or, or relevant background to the board. Um, the reform of the ARBC, I, I think that made sense. I mean, look, this is a serious project. Flooding is fundamental here. We can have the best schools and roads and churches and, 
and, and, and communities, but if they're underwater, it doesn't matter. It's yeah. fundamental. And so I think doing work to reform and professionalize the board is something that makes sense. It's worked well in the greater New Orleans area after Katrina and some of the, the consolidation and changes they made. So certainly supportive of the objectives of that. Um, we have been working with them uh, a bit. They, they just recently hired an executive director and kind of reconstituting themselves. So we haven't had a ton of interaction with, you know, what I'll call the new board. But, you know, let me say it again, fully support the, the goals of that uh, reform and update. I think there's some other things that probably should be looked at because ultimately the Comet River uh, diversion project is going to take a lot of operations and maintenance to, to maintain that project. We've got to make sure it continues performing at the intended flows and things like that. And ARBC is going to be playing a key role there. Um, we've been working with them on dredging areas of the Amit and Comet River. Um, and, and we're going to have to make sure that those things are maintained, you know, because if you allow water bodies to get clogged up or if you're not performing proper maintenance and they're not draining at the right flow rate, then it's going to cause flooding somewhere. And, and so I, I think it's really important that, that we really professionalize these operations, that we, we maintain an appropriate standard of performance of these projects. And, and uh, so we're going to be working with ARBC to make sure that the billions of dollars we secured in new investments continue to perform to the level they're supposed to. So one more question regarding some of the things you said, the uh, sort of French settlement uh, Port Vincent spillway that you discussed. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I, I I have to claim ignorance, which is not good, being on this side of the table and having to say that. But I haven't heard a whole lot about that. Yeah. Um, so this came up um, whenever we were working with, with the, the region. We had folks, representatives from Livingston Parish, obviously, uh, folks like Mark Harrell and, and uh, former Parish President Leighton Ricks and, uh, and others. We had um, folks from... East Baton Rouge, including the mayor and uh, public works director and others we were meeting with. And in Ascension Parish, um, the, uh, the, the current parish president and his former CAO and others. And just talking through, as, as you may know, there were uh, lawsuits that were filed between parishes and oh, fights yeah. that were going on. In fact, uh, even fights in a parish I didn't mention in Iberville Parish, where Iberville and East Baton Rouge were fighting. And the, the parish president in Iberville said that he was going to go, I think, lay down on the road or something like that and make the mayor of Baton Rouge pick him up. And I mean, just it, it got it got pretty colorful. And so but 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 colorful meant that folks were fighting with one another and it was delaying flood protection. So we began kind of forcing everyone to the table and in two areas. One of them is the Emmett Comet Basin. And then the other one is kind of the Bayou Manchac, Bayou Paul over, you know, St. Gabriel and areas of Baton Rouge. Um, we began forcing everyone to the table and saying, let's talk about these things. And as a result of that, we realized that we really did need more capacity to, and this was based upon models. This isn't, you know, somebody just sticking their finger in the air, uh, based upon models that, that we needed more capacity to drain the Emmett River. And so looked at a number of things. Could you, could you dredge the Emmett out? Could you dredge the Blind River out? Um, uh, the diversion canal, what could we do to increase flow? And it, and it finally was determined that the best solution was actually building a third outlet. Mm -hmm. And so um, so this project, again, it's about $50 million. We secured the funding for it, uh, federal funds, uh, a few years ago. And uh, that project is currently in engineering and design. As I said, we've done the modeling for it to prove the capacity. One of the things they're looking at I, I'm sorry for nerding out a little no, bit, but, okay. but, uh, but, but one of the things I mentioned is it's not designed to flow, at least the preliminary engineering, not designed to flow all the time. So they would put some type of sill on it to where the water would only flow out of that spillway whenever the Emmett River levels reach a certain height um, or certain flow. That way you can continue enjoying all the recreation and other features on, on the uh, lower, you know, diversion canal and, and Emmett River. And you're not going to have a situation where you're walking across the river because it's dry. <laughs> right, right, gotcha. No, no, and, and the reason I asked that, and, and I'm glad you've nerded out, so to speak, because a lot of people have gotten very educated about these topics around here. Uh, you know, one of the things that somebody brought up to me the other day, and I was just kind of, you know, shocked, I was a little taken aback, was they said, well, you know, I read that the, the co-meet flows are supposed to be this, and uh, the flood mitigation, like if you're looking at the 2016 models, are roughly two to three feet in the Denim area, and I was like, Okay. 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 Yeah, we can have that conversation. 
so I kind of wanted to ask you about that, you know, in terms of uh, what, and you answered the question, once it reaches a certain level, it will kick in and it, it will act as a spillway. Uh, so that, Which, by the way, that's how the Comet River diversion works as well. There's a sill on that one too. Gotcha. Uh, do we know what that, that sill level is or have, has that um, yet to be determined? So on the, uh, on the Highway 22 spillway, um, my guess is there is an engineer out there that right now could probably answer that question. I'll just tell you, based upon the meetings I had, they were, they, which are months old is the last update I've got, they were still looking at what that right flow rate was. And it's all about preserving, you know, again, the proper flow. You know, some of the things that I really like, but I think probably would, would get into some really expensive cost is where you could actually control cell levels or have gates or something along those lines, which I'm not going to say is totally out of the question, but I'm going to defer to the engineers and experts on this one to determine what that right uh, rate is. But but you got to strike that right balance. Obviously, let me say it again, we don't want to do anything to adversely affect the recreational opportunities that are on the the, the, the lower river and the, and the diversion canal. Um, but But obviously, during high water times during floods and, and high rain events, we've got to get the water out as quick as possible. So they're looking at that right balance and, and I'm happy to come back uh, to you and, and give you uh, an, an explicit answer if the engineers have, have landed on a height or an elevation or flow rate. Sure, and it's important to let folks know real quick before we move on uh, to the last thing we want to talk about. Uh, the Amy at Port Vincent and French Settlement is is low. The depth is very shallow, uh, especially compared to like the Watson area yeah. where it can get up to 35, 36 feet. Yeah, and so McHugh, part of the overall work that we're doing includes dredging certain sections or doing clearing and snagging. And so, you know, for example, the, the, the mouth of the Amy, there are efforts underway to dredge, you know, some of these areas, but you don't want to go in and just dredge an area if the models don't show that it's actually sure. going to improve flow. So uh, making sure that these are informed decisions to where we're investing dollars, not wasting them. Sure. So we talked about a, a lot about water, <laughs> a lot about flooding, disasters, that kind of thing. Um, but water, take disasters out of it, it's always there. Uh, so a water conservation bill, I believe, has come out of committee. Uh, you were, you're on that committee. Uh, Y'all made some amendments to it, but this is regard with regard to our ongoing use of water permitting and that kind of thing. So yeah. walk us through what the bill's about and then why you wanted to change yeah, it. Yeah, sure. So uh, this goes back to some legislation dating back to the early 1970s. And um, it, it has to do with everything from what many people in <clears throat> Livingston Parish or, or this region are familiar with, and that's a 404 wetlands permit. Anytime you, you want to go do something, whether it's, you know, build a driveway or build a house or some other type of structure or a road. Oftentimes, uh, there are wetlands that are impacted from, from that work. And there's something called a 404 permit. It's related to Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, where you have to go to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and get a permit to do that work. And then you have to mitigate for, uh, for the impacts to the wetlands that you've caused. Well, there has been this ridiculous cat and mouse game with the EPA and the Corps of Engineers on one side and, and basically citizens of the country on the other, where what the law says, and I'm going to nerd out again, and I'm sorry, but, but Go for it. what the law says is the law says that, that, that wetlands have to be connected to, quote, navigable water bodies, navigable water bodies. I mean, so to me, when I think navigable, I think the Mississippi River, that's We're navigable. Um, I would even say that the that the Amy, you know, you can you can navigate that, but when you start getting into some of these smaller bayous and streams and others, the reality is, unless you're in a really small kayak or something, which I don't really consider navigating, I, that's not really what I think Congress intended. So so what's happened? And, and this is crazy, but this is this is true. <laughs> the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the EPA got together. And, and, and I'm going to use the word, they conspired to create jurisdiction over every bit of isolated wetland, water body, puddle, bog that they could find. And, the, and, and, and so you can imagine, you, you have some bog or, or, or puddle that is miles and miles, I mean, maybe 30, 50 miles from every, any body of water that is truly navigable. But the Corps of Engineers and EPA would claim jurisdiction. So we start saying, well, how in the world are you saying this is connected to a navigable water body? I'm not kidding. Here's what they did. They said, well, what happens is that migratory birds 
fly to a navigable water body, then they fly over and, and, and land in this isolated bog wetland puddle. And so therefore, that's what Congress meant, is that it's connected to a navigable water body through a migratory bird. Now, look, I, I throw the flag on that one. Yeah. That's, that's bull. I mean, that's bull. Sure. So, so you can imagine that this ultimately, somebody spent, I'm sure, six figures, if not a million bucks on lawyer's fees and challenged this all the way to Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, you know, they said, no, 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 that's ridiculous. They threw it out. So the EPA and Corps of Engineers come back and I may get my order wrong, but, but they, they did another approach. It might have been the, this one first and migratory birds second. But in any case, they said, OK, OK, it's, it's not migratory birds. However, they are, they are connected through underground aquifers. So aquifers underground, you know, the Sparta aquifer or whatever, um, that, that, that these bogs or wetlands drain into, even if they're 50 miles from a, a navigable water body, they all drain into an underground aquifer uh, that provides groundwater. And, and so, uh, once again, I, I throw the yellow flag and say that's bull. And ultimately, somebody spent, I'm sure, an exorbitant amount of money, and they took this all the way to the Supreme Court. And, um, and, and they lost, and, and meaning the EPA and the court lost. And, and the court said, no, 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 this is bull. So there's been this cat and mouse game. If anybody's interested, one of them was called the Rapanos decision. Another one was called Swank. Um, and um, it was a sewage and water authority of, of Cook County, I believe, in Illinois. Um, and so there were a number of different cases that were out there where there was a more recent one where, where the EPA under the Obama administration was trying to say that, that WOTUS, which is Waters of the U.S., which is related to wetlands, that it is defined by all of these things that, you know, once again, just brought in everything. What, what they said is they said that any area that, um, what, what do they call it, that um, drains rainfall, drains rainfall. So we'll said, I said, shoot, that's my front yard. I mean, when it rains, you know, like that. Right. And, and so once again, there was a challenge. Uh, just, I, I, I believe it was last year, Supreme Court once again came out. And again, this is a cat and mouse game. It's a whack-a-mole. Um, Supreme Court came out and said, no, 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 this is bull. So there was a bill that we did. And, and what it does is it tries to help to streamline and, and refine the process by which WOTUS definition is declared. It, it, it tries to expedite the utilization and, you know, with right permitting and all that stuff for different types of projects. And what we did is the Supreme Court, excuse me, the EPA and the Corps have failed to issue any new guidance on how this new Supreme Court decision is supposed to be interpreted in South Louisiana, which is, has wetlands all over the place. And so we did an amendment that directs them to provide guidance to the public, to the Corps of Engineers, and to the EPA that, that says this is how this is now going to be applied because the court has thrown out these Obama-era rules that were way too liberal. And so you got to tell us what rules we're operating under. We also did some things to try to further streamline the process that if you do need permits and things like that, that you, can, you have better certainty on timelines, better certainty on what rules you have to abide by. And, and so really, this is all about just trying to strike that right balance in protecting the environment and not stymieing or preventing economic use or development of properties that are privately owned. And I think a lot of people around here would like to also say in sort of stymieing a little bit of government overreach. Or Con a lot. Or a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did use the word conspire. Yeah. So uh, I know a lot of people, especially uh, developers around here, and I know economic development especially, uh, it's been very interesting watching them compete uh, over wetlands uh, permits and things like that. So I know they have to be happy that you're, you're fighting the good fight. Yeah, well, and look, McHugh, you know, I'll give you another example. And I talked about that 900 miles of clearing and snagging. That requires permits from the Corps of Engineers. We ran in all kinds of problems from the Corps of Engineers working with the parish trying to get permits to do that work. And I mean, look, it's not like we're trying to go out there and go, you know, pour concrete over a wetland. We're simply trying to restore function to a drainage canal or to a bayou or stream or river or waterway. And the Corps of Engineers was fighting us on this stuff. You know, and, and, and look, I got to tell you, it, it, nothing makes me more mad or frustrated than things like that. Whenever all you're trying to do is do what's right, do something good, and you've got your own government that's out there obstructing you and saying, no, no, we want you to keep flooding. And, and, and obviously they're not saying that out loud, but by their actions, that's exactly what's, what they are saying. And, and so it, it, we really have to reform and streamline the way that all of these permits and regulations are forced upon 
private families, homeowners, businesses, it, it's, it's really frustrating. And it's like a hidden tax because it costs so much time and money to comply with all of these, all the red tape and, and jump through the hoops. And there's a lot of them. So thank you, sir. You Appreciate thank you, you taking the time. If you want to introduce yourself real quick. All right. I'm uh, Congressman Garrett Graves, and we represent uh, South Louisiana and the United States House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. And uh, great to be back with you. Always a pleasure to have you in the studio, sir. I know you're a busy man. I appreciate you taking the time. I know you're going to be in Livingston Parish today, Tuesday, February 20th. So hopefully you'll have some good news to share or get to hear about what's going on. Uh, my name is McHugh David, publisher and editor of the news. Appreciate you guys for joining us uh, for Around Livingston. This is a podcast brought to you by the Livingston Parish News. Please remember that we are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. We are once a week in print on Thursdays at $7 a month to get that in your mailbox. And we're also online, www.livingstonparishnews.com. We appreciate you joining us, and we'll see you next time.